although this is your uh, first much-awaited presence within the UNESCO Festival, I have the information that this is not the first time actually you are in Romania. Is my information correct? Yes, that's correct. This is not the first time I am in Romania, but the first time I am in Bucharest. Um, since the 90s, I have two orphanages, um, little houses for uh, children in Victoria as well as in Hermannstadt, um, whom I'm, you know, taking care for. Uh, they have been built through benefit concerts I have given in Germany with Lambert Orchest together, and I have been visiting them and, you know, just um, rejoining the boys in Victoria and the girls in Hermannstadt to, s you know, see how they are doing and I'm sending regular um, Christmas and also Easter gifts and for me it's important to be there for um, particularly children or old people or people with special needs and to give them the feeling of if they feel lost that there is at least one person who does care. Where would you place the UNESCO festival within the other major festivals of the world today? You know, UNESCO was not only for Romania, but for the history of music, and particularly also for the history of violin, but not only. Yes. Uh, such a major figure that one would expect, of course, only the very uh, best of a festival running under his name. And that is particularly, you know, the case uh, here in Bucharest. It's, it's incredible, the amount um, and the quality of um, orchestras and soloists and conductors performing here and it, clearly you know um, the UNESCO festival reigns amongst the most important festivals in the world and um, I feel very honored to be invited particularly with the group I am mm -hmm. performing Bucharest because it is a project it is part of my life which is very dear to me my foundation which exists in 17 years and it's in aid of young string players worldwide and what one will hear in Bucharest um, is the Mutas Vetubosi, mm -hmm. consisting of um, actual and past scholars of my foundation from all nations around the world. <laughs> It is a well-known fact that uh, your beginnings are marked by the figure, the larger-than-life figure uh, of uh, Herbert von Karajan. Yes. Um, what is the most important lesson you learned from him? Yeah, this is, a, this is a question which has been asked to me quite a few times yes, and I have sure. never really found an answer which would do justice mm -hmm. uh, to the 13 years of collaboration I was, I was you know, really blessed to have with Herbert von Karajan. Um, the work ethic was just tremendous because he was relentlessly curious in reshaping his interpretation, his viewpoint on music. But um, above everything else, I think he has put the seed of love for a young generation and the necessity, the duty of helping a young generation into many of the musicians he has uh, worked with. Um, and his, one of his uh, mottos was, if you have ever reached all your goals, you might have chosen them too low. 
So that's something to you know live by. You always have to um, enlarge your horizon, and you always have to realize that you are there also to help others. You were only 13 uh, when you played with him and yes. uh, with the Berliner Philharmoniker. How was that? Um, hmm, it was a little bit like in 13. a dream, you know. Because when, when, I, when I auditioned for him in 1976 in December, of course I went to Berlin to play for him without any hope to ever work with him. And I was rather... Um, how should I say? I was rather calm because I didn't see any, you know, any chance to, you know, e even being taken serious. And therefore, I just played, you know, I was kind of ready to go home and, you know, uh, live with Waterloo. You were a teenager. Yes. Yeah. Was, was that the, the craziness of youth, let's say? It wasn't my <laughs> idea. I actually didn't want to go there. Um, it all happened after a performance at another great European festival, the Luzern mm -hmm. Music Festival. And they still have a series where they are presenting young artists. And I did play among other young artists the recital there. And apparently, you know, people talked about it. And that's how Herbert von Karajan heard about uh, me. And that was the initial reason for him to invite me to, um, uh, to play for him, which I then, you know, tried to hold off. But anyhow, there was this one day, the 11th of December in 1976, where I then <laughs> traveled to Berlin and where I just played the best I could without having any hope. And, you know, to my incredible amazement, he told me that we would play together in 1977 in Salzburg at the festival there another great festival, mm -hmm. um, one of the Mozart Concerti. And that was the beginning, really, of 13 years collaboration until his death. Um, how was it to play with the Berlin Flower? It was just, it was like a dream, yeah. you know, to start performing on the highest possible level with an orchestra where you, there would be no musical wishes unanswered or unfulfilled, but of course, it also set the standard of my expectations of myself. and unavoidably so, of my partners, my musical partners, very high. Along the years, you have been offered a series of compositions written especially for you. Yes. And I was wondering, who is the artist or, or what is he like uh, from the scores that you discover? You is it in, another in self of you that you discover within those compositions? No, uh, yes and no. This, this is a very good question because obviously um, it's always the composer I, I want to, you know, be the humble servant for. But then, at the end of the day, it is wonderful to f have become, for some of the living composers, a kind of muse. Um, exactly. Which, of course, will always, you know, be there, whereas the composer is here. Um, but um, I've been told that some composers do, in fact, write with a specific player um, in mind. Mm -hmm. Others just write, in any case, what they, you know, uh, what they have in mind, and they don't need to focus on a specific quality of singing or playing. But in the case of Wolfgang Riem, for example, who wrote several pieces, Time Chant, and, um, and also a very difficult piece for violin and double bass, it was the high register of my violin which triggered the idea to 
compose something which is really only dealing with that high register. Other than that, there are always things in a contemporary composition, like the Nonette, mm -hmm. which we uh, will give a Romanian uh, premiere of Andre uh, Previn in the program with the Virtuosi. In the Nonette, there are, you will always find things in a contemporary composition with, who are pushing you to the limits of your intellectual yes. and also your physical abilities. And that is, I think, what besides the noble duty of bringing contemporary music forward for an audience is something which has very much attracted me to that kind of uh, language because I want to enlarge my abilities. I want to learn and I want to grow and I want to be always pushed to a border where I feel I could fail because, you know, failure is part of human life. Uh, the question is how you deal with it. I was going to ask you yeah, that we, because we, I'm sure that uh, in an artist's life there are moments of False notes, let's say, of oh, yes. not so happy <laughs> evenings. How yep. do you over, overpass this? Yeah, you know, false notes at the end of the day, of course you try to avoid them because, you know, a certain level of perfection is just, um, just the beginning of being a musician who is hopefully very expressive and able to find a unique mm -hmm and very personal viewpoint of pieces which have been around for centuries so the audience can hear them refreshed, they can re-detect them, you know. In, in a way you have to reinvent uh, interpretation of pieces like Vivaldi because you do not want to give the audience the impression of a déjà vu experience. <laughs> Yes, wrong notes, of course, you know, one doesn't like that. But, but also metaphorically speaking, there yes, are metaphorically speaking, bad nights or There are so nights good. which are difficult, Yes, where you go on stage and you feel that despite you having slept enough or, you know, eaten the right things and rehearsed enough, it's just not flying. The acoustic maybe is hostile, the audience is hmm, shuffling yeah. around, and you just can feel that they are not with you. Then, of course, you have to come up with the most intense and wonderful performance. And what counts is that you get through the struggle and you make the best out of what, what is there at that given time.
But what about the good nights, the, the nights <laughs> when you have the feeling that stars aligned, you know? <laughs> are those nights difficult to overpass too? Those nights are an inspiration to set the barn even higher yes. and to fly even higher. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you were uh, mentioning earlier uh, you will be playing in uh, Bucharest in a couple of hours, yep. uh, Andrew Previn, but also Vivaldi. Yes. And this is a huge arch in time. Uh, yep. Does this require a special focus from your, yep. from your side? Um, I think the arch is really interesting, as you are mentioning it. We start with Penderecki, piece mm -hmm. commissioned by my foundation for this wonderful double bass player, for whom actually also this nonette was intended, particularly because the nonette, as it says, for nine people, is for a double string quartet in the, and in the middle is the double bass. Um, yes, the arch from the 21st century back, you know, to the, to the 17th, 17th century, century uh, it's, it's a quite... Um, inspirational and changing the language within the recital repertoire or within a chamber music repertoire is something which is actually rather common and I like these extreme arches because they are hopefully thrilling or at least uniquely challenging to the audience as well and I want to challenge audience because the arts particularly music are not only there for our pleasure but they are there to make us rethink what we know about them uh, they are to provoke also in a certain way and definitely to expand our knowledge and our appetite for music. <laughs> Have you ever lost faith in you? Uh, as a person or as a As musician? an artist. As an artist. Yes. Um, you know, I don't take myself as an artist that terribly serious. <laughs> um, I'm trying to be a useful member of human society. And in that I haven't lost faith because there are still so many things I can do for society so many uh, humanitarian projects I can work for that hopefully at the end of my days um, it's not about beautiful notes you know my life but about my children and about my legacy which will always be people in need
The big emotions of life, uh, whether positive or negative, should influence one artist's performance? I think they will, unavoidably so. Uh, of course, there's a certain objectivity you are trying to reach, but then talking with um, living composers, you find out that there are really many ways which lead to Bucharest, to <laughs> Rome, to Penderecki, to Preven. And these composers are extremely open-minded, as were Mozart and Beethoven, if you read their letters. You find out that they have always embraced a very passionate style of performing, a very um, personal style of performing. And that is, I think, what you know, we all uh, try to achieve. What have you lost from your artistic youth and gained from your artistic maturity? I think as an artist, if you look at early drawings, uh, and I'm not putting myself on the same level with Picasso, but just generally, if, if you have an artist in front of you and you see their talent at the age of five or six, like mm -hmm. in Mozart's cases, as a performer as well as a composer, or Picasso's children's paintings, um, and that's why the work for my foundation is for me so fascinating, because you, you get to know a person by the age of 10 or 12, a scholar, and then you know, I will try to develop the talent and shield it from all unnecessary pitfalls. Um, so at the end of the day, it's not about youth or experience in life. I think it's just generally how you mature as a person, and that will be mirrored. In, in your playing. There is a certain maturity in young musicians which have nothing to do with their age. And I hope, you know, in the playing of, not only hope, I know that in the playing of many performers way beyond my age, um, there also is a youthful joy and um, passion in the playing, which is once again nothing to do. We have a society is so transfixed on labels. Um, particularly on the label young and old. And young is not an achievement and oldness mm -hmm. is not, you know, something. A loss or, yeah, yes. Exactly. So it, either way it can be positive, either way it can mean nothing. <laughs>
did music make you a better person? I don't think so, but I think that music made me very early aware that um, it is more than a pastime, it is more than a profession, it's actually a calling and it is a calling for you to become a bridge builder uh, between uh, society, between uh, different nations, between um, clearly, you know, uh, different cultural and religious backgrounds. Music is the only language which binds all of us together. It's the only way where we can meet in a room where there's no competition one against the other, where we are all the same and we all can express the same and experience the same emotions. So I think there is much more to music uh, in society, particularly today, where we have to get, you know, move closer together and that where we have to train respect and love for each other more than ever before. Music will help us in kindergarten to understand where we come from, what songs we share, what language, what, you know, we all have the same need for love and protection. Yours is one of the most uh, high-profile classical figures uh, um, today in the classical music. Uh, and I'm sure you sometimes get tired. Uh, what does uh, uh, get you tired the most? Uh, the frequent traveling, uh, being in constant demand, interviews like this. Do you ever get tired of music? Um, I have a quite high level of energy. Um, and when I'm not performing, actually I love to be at home with my children. And, you know, just recently I cooked 10 kilos of marmalade because my trees in Austria, they were really having lots of apricots. Actually the tree had 30 kilos, but I, I could only handle 10 of them. Uh, traveling can be annoying, yes, particularly when, you know, there are uh, strikes and all of that. But it, that's part of the picture. When it is 8 o'clock, or in the case of Bucharest, when it's 5 o'clock mm -hmm. in the afternoon, that's all what counts. No matter what has happened before, it will happen after. That's when I will give my very best for the next two hours. to purify yourself from the music of one concert mm -hmm. in order to go to, to the other one, to the next one? You know, very often artists, also colleagues of mine, have to um, study one repertoire while they are on stage with the second right. one and still thinking of a third one coming up later on. Therefore, there's a lot of repertoire going on What, in terms of purifying, if, if one you know, w wants to use that word. I think silence and nature is still the best way to really um, admire creation and, and, you know, become calm and one again.
you have been blessed uh, not only with talent but with a very charming persona. And um, thank you. I was you too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, and I uh, I wanted to know how important, in your opinion, is image for a classical musician today? You know, when I grew up under the wings of Herbert von Karajan and my wonderful violin teacher Ada Stucki, um, the word image didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And I would wish that uh, these questions would never be put forward to a young generation of musicians because it makes you lose your artistic innocence. Mm -hmm. And artistic innocence, uh, of course, your own spiritual innocence as well, which goes hand in hand, is so important in life. Because once you look uh, into you know, trying to please what people expect of you, uh, once you look into the corner of sales figures, you have already lost yourself. And that is you know, what is so great in, in, in the case of such huge figures like Dino Lipati or Clara Husky or obviously George Enescu. This was a generation which they were like monks for music. You know, of course you have to lead a normal life as a, as a woman and as a man, but what I mean with that is they were solely concerned about creation, composing, conducting, playing, uh, you know, playing for sick ones, playing in circumstances of war, uh, just being there for society, never mind image. I don't know where this all came about. It has nothing to do with the arts and it should not be considered. You're also uh, um, an artist devoted to the other forms of art, not only music. And I know you love uh, visual arts. Tell me a bit about this. Um, yes, um, paintings and sculptures have been a great source of inspiration um, to me. I probably it started with Paul Sacher, the great uh, music um, mezzene of the last century, also conductor, a friend of Stravinsky. Um, of obviously all the composers which, which I have been, you know, um, really um, honored to, to first perform. And Paul Sacher was the man who introduced me to contemporary painting and sculpture. Uh, it was Brancusi, of course, uh, uh, <laughs> what, what, what a genius, you know, what he could express in just an egg-shaped uh, yes. head. This is something, this is like Mozart, it gives me goosebumps. It's the reduction to the essence of the arts. And this has been um, and still is a great inspiration in my life. Sometimes when I, I am at a loss to explain the music of Debussy to a student from the Far East, yes. I go to the museum and we look at a painting by Monet and yes, suddenly, absolutely. you know, there are things which other than if you would be a poet, which I'm not, you cannot express with language and you just have to see, you have to feel, you have to hear and the visual arts uh, are, you know, very helpful in that sense.
Your name is probably the most beautiful word in the whole world, <laughs> that is mother. Yep. What kind of mother are you? Oh, better not ask my children. <laughs> um, <laughs> I try to be, you know, there for my children. I love them to bits and uh, it's very difficult to, you know, be objective. I just, I try very hard to be, uh, um, to be the mother they need to be in every ever-changing instant of their life, of their uh, um, progression, um, different needs, you know, with uh, different chapters in their life. But of course, you also have to be firm and point out um, possible dangers, clearly knowing that we all went through moments of struggle and despair, although our parents have tried to save us from that. And life is, as I said earlier on, life is a struggle at times, and we all um, need to get through that and you know pick ourselves up but if you know that you have at least one person in your life which is your mother which will always love you no matter what you do that I think that gives you a wonderful blanket you can come back to <laughs> Do you have to juggle with being a full-time mom or a full-time artist? Um, it is not easy to be yes. as many how do you you do know, that? thousands and millions of women uh, who are single mothers. Um, I lost the father, my husband, of my children when I was 33, yes. so that's um, 20 years ago. Um, it is very difficult to be a single mom and have a profession, but for an artist, it is, it is also needed, and as a person, this artist also is, to um, be able to develop that side of the personality, and uh, because it brings so much to me as a human being, which I can hopefully then, you know, b bring back to my, my children, that I have tried for many years to play less concerts. Now it has become a little easier because they are grown-ups. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Great pleasure. Thank you for your time.